if you only want to do this, we know that we can take a trace of the matrix and get an, function, get an expression for the eigenvalues, if I only care about eigenvalues. So now I'll take a trace. The trace. I have this operator. It looks like this, y and x. Now what is trace? I identify initial and final point, and I integrate over all such points. Right? That's a trace. For finite matrix, this is a trace. And when it's labeled by continuous index, that's a trace. And we have explicit formula for this. It's dx derived delta function x minus f of x. Now I'll do. It. Let me just do it for discrete time. First time around. So if I want to go n steps and produce a trace, then I'll get n step in time. And because this is a weighted operator, there'll be b, and it'll be integrated n steps in times over the whole thing. But the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. So I have two ways of thinking of trace. Either I solve the problem of the eigenvalues in the matrix, etc., and I compute the eigenvalues, or I compute this. But this is not hard to compute because this is a Dirac delta function. So we know how to integrate a Dirac delta function. We already done it. So how does the right-hand side work? You know, this will get a contribution only in the neighborhood of a periodic point, because that's the definition of periodic point. So this is the reason, you know, I don't care about periodic orbits, they're difficult to compute, etc. But now we are forced to compute them, because we care about the spectrum, but the formula says the way you get the spectrum is to compute periodic orbits. So that's how we got to periodic orbits. I like them because they're invariant objects, but they're a little bit difficult to handle. But here we are forced. We have to do them. Now, in neighborhood at every periodic points, what happens? So let's look at neighborhood. Trace yeah, in a neighborhood of periodic point. So let's take. In the neighborhood of periodic point, I only have to look at the length of the prime cycle because that's when I come back. So I take MP, that's some little neighborhood. You know, for finite times, periodic points are isolated, so I can just kind of put a little ball around them. So that's MP, dx of this quantity, and P of x. Uh, but that we already computed. So this is, for every periodic point, I get a contribution. And then I get the determinant of 1 from taking derivative here, minus taking derivative here. This is Jacobian of periodic orbit. And if I want to be more explicit, this is number of periodic points. And then in d dimensions, so here you get the d dimension thing because you're computing this in the original space, not function space. You have original Jacobian, just the product of the eigenvalues, 1 minus p. These are Floquet multipliers of the orbit. There is a d of them. It's 1. So that's what any periodic point will contribute by the integrating over the whole space. So we get the classical trace formula. And this is horrible. I've run over. Whoever is watching this, I'll write it on again. It's in the book, the missing part of this formula. Uh, I'm sure that Sean Ding won't be watching this because it's too boring. <coughs> So now what I'll do is what we did before. I'll take z and n. I'll take a trace of this thing to the power n. I'll sum over all n's, just as we did for the original simple transfer matrix. So this was called t before 
zeros and ones, but now it's this operator. So this is geometric sum, so it looks like trace of Zn, that's C lambda over C, 1 minus Z lambda. So that's just this geometric sum. Remember, operator is like a matrix, so it sums up in the same way. But then we have uh, this other formula that says that this thing is sum of all periodic orbits. For every periodic orbit, you get all periodic points on it because each periodic point contributes. Uh, you get all the repeats to infinity. You get a determinant for each one, 1 minus jp repeated m times. Then, because we stuck these little z's here to keep track of the length of the orbit, it's z to the length of the orbit. Uh, and every time we repeat it, I get it again. And then I get, from here, I get this weight, which is v repeated times a computed on the orbit. Voila. So now, the first trace formula, this one, these are the same formulas. The first trace formula, because of course, trace is the sum of the eigenvalues, so that's obvious. The first trace formula is a finite matrix, it has ones and zeros, etc., and you assign the weight to each of these things. Now it turns out, when you do this on the space of functions and you pick up not coarse grain but exact information which are periodic orbits, it has the same structure. It says you can do it on the eigenfunctions here, that's global, or you can evaluate trace using the property that that's a recurrent solution. So you evaluate it, and each trace is weighted by the length of the orbit. Then it has some exponential which is inherited from here, which you will need to weigh the particular orbit. So this is the weight of particular orbit. Everything is computed on that orbit. And then it's divided by determinant, which you didn't see here very clearly, but it's kind of hidden in this formulation. And what this determinant says, I'll explain it next time, but basically this is measuring the volume that periodic orbit owns. So very unstable orbit will have very large multipliers here, so they'll have small volumes. So this is really a geometrical thing that says every orbit owns a tube, its length is NP, and its thickness is, you know, inverse inverse uh, multipliers. So if it's very unstable, the neighborhood is very thin. So there's a geometric weight, and then there's a thing that you're measuring here. And this geometric weight is where the natural measure is now hidden. You know, natural measure tells you how likely it to be, but now it's very smart. It's just computed on periodic orbit, and it'll tell you this orbit is very important because this is a small weight. The other orbit is not important at all because it's a minuscule weight because it's very unstable. So it says when you're computing averages on stable systems, the least unstable periodic orbits are the most important because you spend most time in their neighborhoods. And, uh, but this is now exact formula including all of them. So the rest of this course will think about how to use this. And it turns out you know, super elegant. It, you know, it has to be hyperbolic, it must not have marginal eigenvalues. So that's why we did Poincaré sections and continuous. We, we always have to evaluate, eliminate all marginal eigenvalues. Stable ones, okay. It's, you know, it's just a number. So if it's stable, yeah, usually there's some are stable, some unstable, and you have eliminated the marginal ones by taking care of symmetries, because exact marginal ones only happen generically if you have exact symmetry. That's a consequence of symmetry. They also happen if you have a bifurcation, but that's non-generic, so that's something you have to study separately. So this is it. We can, course is over. We'll just, uh, you know, tie up a few details.